We've been in California for a couple of weeks now, I guess. Trying to get away from Florida's heat. Didn't work this year. <laughs> we did get lucky in the Denver area. They had rain and cool nights. The days weren't bad. Driving across the country is always a fantastic experience. It's an amazing country we live in. As screwed up as it is. It's beautiful. No more, he can't do that no more. No, he can't do that no more. Ooh, things ain't like they was before. You can't do that no more. Watch your coffee in the morning, you pick a lady that night. And don't stay out in the sun too long. You best stay out of sight. Things ain't like they was before. You can't do that no more. I started writing when I realized middle age was slipping by. Don't be smoking cigarettes, surely don't do dope. God knows where you're gonna turn when you just can't cope with those things they like it was before. You can't do that no more. Chicken and chicken. 
thought it was a duck. Put it on the table, legs stuck up. Then come my sister with a spoon and glass. Dishing out the gravy from the yes, yes, yes. Rag mama, you better rag mama. Rag mama, Ooh, come on girl and do that rag. Well, there was two old ladies laying in the sand. One said, mama wished you was a man. Look here, girl, stop raising sand. Turn it on over, do the best I can. Rag. Made one blues record, two songs, and he got religion. Big City could do that to many. Recorded a handful of Christian songs and spent 25 years singing on the streets with a tin cup tied on his guitar, singing for Jesus and spare change. And then in 1960 it happened, the great folk music scare of 1960 hit Greenwich Village. <laughs> Everybody was playing folk music, record deals were going down, and Peter, Paul, and Mary had a group, and they put out their first record. They sang a song they heard the preacher sing on 135th Street. A song about Samson and Delilah. The record sold a couple of million copies. A lot of money was being made off of folk music back then. Peter, Paul, and Mary being good folk singers, 
told their manager that Reverend Gary Davis should get a piece of the money because they got the song from him. And uh, Reverend Davis was summoned for it. He went down to the publisher's office and talked to those people. And there were a bunch of lawyers and publishers down there, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and their manager. Peter told me this story, so I know it's true. I think it was Peter. It might have been Paul. They all looked the same to me. <laughs> said to Reverend Davis, so did you write this song about Samson and Delilah? And he was sitting there in the chair with his sunglasses on, the big hat and overcoat. He said he didn't write any songs. And them lawyers were getting all excited about it. They were grinning and poking each other in the side. <laughs> they were still grinning and poking when Reverend Davis leaned back in the chair and he said, that song was revealed to me in the spring of 28. <laughs> Peter, Paul, and Mary pointed at that contract on the desk and they put Reverend Davis's name on the contract. And they handed him the pencil and he put his mark down. They counted out $500 for the old blind preacher. That's a lot of money back then for a fellow singing on the streets. And that was only the beginning because folk music really took off and uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary started selling a lot of records and the checks started coming pretty regular. And before long, Reverend Davis had himself his own folk music manager. A great man named Manny Greenhill up in Cambridge, Massachusetts had a little operation he called Folklore Productions and he was managing people like Joan Baez and Doc Watson, Dave Van Ronk, and he signed Reverend Gary Davis. And Reverend Davis soon after stopped singing on the streets because folk music was getting big and people wanted to hear the real folk music. But Reverend Davis toured the world. Built them a house in Long Island, we still lovingly refer to as the house of Peter, Paul, and Mary built. <laughs> I had the phone number sitting on my bureau for about two weeks trying to get up my courage to call up the great Reverend, because this fellow told me the Reverend could teach me how to play the guitar. So I called him up one day and told him who I was and what my plan was, and uh, he said he could teach me something for sure. Asked me if I had any money. Not that he needed anymore, he was doing fine, but he didn't like people coming over to just gawk at him, you know what I mean? I feel that way myself sometimes. <laughs> so I asked him, how much money do you need? He said, five dollars to get you a guitar lesson. I said, I got the money. He said, well, when do you want to come over? And I was still a little nervous about it. I said, a week from Thursday. He said, I'm an old man. <laughs> you better come over now. <laughs> so I said, okay, how do I don't want to get there. He said, I'll give you my address and you take a subway train over there. So I wrote down the address, packed up my guitar, and I went down and looked over the subway scene there. There's a lot of trains in New York, A train, E train, F train, G train, Double D, and a couple other ones I don't remember. I wasn't sure what to do, and I wanted to do the cool, hip thing, so I took the A train. <laughs> wasn't exactly the right train, but looking back on it, it was very hip. <laughs> Finally got to Reverend Davis's house. He says, what can you play on the guitar? So I played him some of the Candyman Blues. That was a song associated with him, and it was my only new three songs, and it was probably my best song at the time. And he listened to me play it. He said, good God to mighty, you sound like Dave Van Ronk. <laughs> Well, that was the nicest thing anybody had ever said about my playing at the time, but Reverend Davis didn't like the way Dave Van Rock changed the arrangement. <laughs> Reverend Davis liked people to play his music exactly like he did. So we played guitar down his basement for about four hours, maybe five hours. It's hard to unlearn your best song when you're pleased with it. <laughs> Ended up by the time I got finished, Reverend Davis didn't care for the way I played the Candyman Blues and either the Dave Van Rock, but they're both dead and here I am at Tipperon, the Lord of the Mysterious Ways. So after playing guitar down in the basement all those hours, Mrs. Davis called us up for supper. I knew something was cooking up there because I never smelled such a weird smell in the house before. She was boiling up turkey wings and she served them with tomato paste and Velveeta cheese on them, had a big pot of collard greens going with all kinds of pig parts in there. I was a long-haired vegetarian with a mustache at the time. It was the most horrendous thing I had ever smelled. I forced myself to have seconds because I read somewhere you had to suffer to sing the blues. <laughs> It wasn't easy getting it down. I cut up those little pieces of pig to 
tiny little parts and I swallowed them whole to get the protein, you know. I learned that from a Tarzan book. <laughs> and so they ate raw antelopes in the jungle or something. Reading is very good for a kid. After supper, we went back down in the basement and I said to Reverend Davis, how about uh, 12 Gates to the City? He said, you gotta get the Candyman song right first. <laughs> o'clock in the morning I told him I had to split because I had a philosophy class at 8 o'clock and I was a college boy. He said, don't forget. I said, I won't forget this as long as I live. He said, what's that? I said, my guitar lesson to my supper. He said, don't forget you owe me five dollars. <laughs> I reached into my pocket and I gave him five. That's where that expression started, April 23rd, 1966. <laughs> Laugh. Next day I was back at 11.30, not even thinking that Mrs. Davis was going to serve leftovers for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I told her I had to leave at 4.15, I didn't want to get roped into another soul food supper. And on my way out, Reverend Davis said not to come by for two weeks because he was going on a tour. I said to him, I had $50 saved up, maybe I'll go on a tour with him. And he laughed at me, he said, $50 won't get you very far in 1966. So I said goodbye to Mrs. Davis, and she gave me some supper to take home. <laughs> Before I got out the door, Reverend Davis said, if you want to go on a tour, you be here tomorrow morning, and bring your $50. Be here at 6.30, and I'm going to carry you with me. He said, you'll get that candy man straightened out. So the next morning I came down there, I'd made the decision to quit school and give up the GI Bill and go on the road with Reverend Davis. 6.25 I was banging on his door and Mrs. Davis came down, uh, came to the door in a house coat with a hair up and curlers and she says, what are you doing here? had my valise with me and my guitar, and I said, Reverend Davis said I could go on a tour and be here at 6.30. She said, well, he's sound asleep. The train don't leave till 6.30 tonight. Come in, I'll make some breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> so this is a song I made up for Reverend Davis. I'll tell you a story about a man I knew. He was a blind street singing, preaching, and played some They danced up and down the board He passed his days just singing and waiting for the Lord the People heard his message, they came from miles around His pulpit was on the streets up in Harlem and way downtown The preacher picked the guitar, his hands made the magic chord Passed his days just singing and waiting for the Lord One day the angels heard him singing Thought he should be heard They opened the ears around the world So he could spread the word And his fingers picked the guitar They danced up and down the board Passed his days just singing And waiting for the Lord Guitar. 
for his hands made the magic chords. Past the days just singing and waiting for the Lord. Six years with my first two wives, not at the same time. <laughs> Back in those days, I used to spend one winter in California and then the next one in Florida because motorhomes don't work so good in the cold weather. About ten years ago, I met my third wife down in St. Pete, Florida. I've ever had a wife that owned a home in St. Pete, Florida. Had a job. It's a plus. <laughs> I still go on the road every spring for eight months. Good for a marriage. <laughs> but I do love my wife. And she wasn't happy in her work. It was a wonderful thing that she uh, had a job. One day she surprised me. She came home from work. One went in. I went 
went out in the driveway, gave her a little round of applause and asked her how her day was. And she said, it's over. And I took your advice. I said, what do you mean? <coughs> she said, just what you told me. I said, why? She said, to make my life better. I said, what'd you do? She said, I quit my job. I said, you what? <laughs> went back to school, got a master's degree in special education. And now she's teaching little five-year-olds. She gets a whole summer off to go on tour with me, which is really fantastic. Sometimes in the winter, I go home for four months. That's a long time for me to live in a house. I get the St. Pete Blues, so I wrote this song. To make a full go round, I said, Hey, hey, baby, Mama, you ain't so such much, you know. I'm going back down to St. Pete, I'm going to leave all this rain, sleep, cold, and snow. Papa told Mama how it's going to be. Mama said, Papa, you just wait and see. I said, Hey, hey, baby. Mama, you ain't so such much, you know. I'm going back down south, I'm gonna leave all, all of this rain, sleep, cold, and snow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, 
wish the whole two of those. That was a good deal. <laughs> now, these guitars were invented in the 20s to make more noise. They work. I do a song here that, uh, let's see, there's a couple of choices. Uh, I learned this song from an old record a fellow made in 1949, a hillbilly country guy named Jimmy Murphy from Knoxville, Tennessee, who, who didn't have a very successful recording career, but I've always identified with him. <laughs> Man sold hundreds of records a few times. <laughs> Speaking of records, uh, we got some CDs with us and some DVDs, instructional and concert, and, and I got a, a book with music in it. I can't read it or write it, but when I, I teach guitar at Yorma Calkinen's Fur Peace Ranch in Ohio, and one of my students was writing out all my material and music. Uh, I saw it laying on the floor. I thought it was Beethoven. <laughs> I said, what's that? He said, no, that's the song you wrote on CD. <laughs> I said, how many of these do you have? He said, oh, about 25. I said, let's do a book. <laughs> so we called up the people that do the books and they put it out, Hal Leonard Publishing with Homespun uh, DVD Company. So we got those books over there too. And uh, I recorded for Peg Leg Records, my own record company. I used to record for Rounder Records for a dozen years and one day I was telling my new wife, I was, I was in their house, I got a desk in the corner of their house. I said, look at this. I said, you realize I'm rounder people who have been making hundreds of dollars a year off of me. <laughs> he says, is that so? I said, well, yeah, that's what it says here. I said, we're going to start our own record company. And we did it, Peg Leg Records. We're making hundreds of dollars a year now, but at least we're getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Only place you can get a Peg Leg Record is from us. We have no distribution and we're not looking for any. <laughs> rounder Records had distribution. It didn't help them. <laughs> So you can get the records and the stuff at, at the gigs, or you can get it on the website. We've got websites now. Before I married my wife Nancy, I didn't have a toaster oven. Now she's got me Wi-Fi from Motel 8 parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> you know, Buck Rogers out there, I'll tell you. You know, I'm in the middle of a computer thing, and I get a call on the cell phone. It's like, wow. <laughs> I mean, for a guy who doesn't plug his guitar in, that's serious progress. <laughs> This song here, uh, just, uh, what was his name? Jimmy Murphy in Knoxville, Tennessee. He wrote about 35 songs. This was the only good one. He had another one that was pretty cool. It was called Holy Ghost Millionaire. <laughs> I'm working on that one. That was a good one. Hard to find Jimmy Murphy records. But uh, this one, he had a couple of great chances too. He was supposed to play at the, on the he was auditioning for the Grand Ole Opry. He got drunk and didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a couple of my friends. <laughs> Chet Atkins got involved in Jimmy's career for a while and produced some sides, but they didn't sell either. It's just uh, it's a funny business. When you're young, you think about selling a lot of records. When you get older, you really don't give a damn. <laughs> I mean, as long as you can draw 40 people a night, work three nights a week. You know, I was telling my new bride not too long ago, she's a little younger than me, I was trying to explain what it was like back in the 60s. I said that, what I remembered. You know, I, said, <laughs> I said, I had a dream back in the 60s. She said, you too? I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, what was your dream? I said, I used to dream of hoboing around America and maybe making $100 a week picking a guitar. She says, well, you've done it. <laughs> Jimmy called the song Electricity. I always like saying it. You can't see electricity when it's moving down the line. How in the world can you doubt it? You can't surely see it shine. When you seek salvation, it's courage you will feel. You won't need nobody mm -mm, tell you that it's real. Some people don't know good music when they hear it in the air. Some people, they don't know their God when they're kneeling down in prayer. But let me 
tell you something and I ain't it gonna tell you wrong When you get salvation You'll know it by its tone from God's fountain runs from up on high and I'm feasting on God's fountain where God's mouth will run dry but you can't see electricity when it's moving down the line how in the world can you doubt it you can surely see it shine when you seek salvation it's courage you will feel you won't need nobody to tell you that it's Mississippi with a new husband. <laughs> <laughs> this is the New Age Woman Blues. This song's been going over pretty well on the West Coast here. <laughs> this one I recorded on my peg leg release called Singer Songwriter Blues Man. I see how I wrote all the songs on. Yeah, she got her 
myself a rabbit's foot and a mojo too And God only knows what tells a little girl what to do When I fly the coop, she knows just where I flew I better let that girl go She got too many friends I don't know I wish I knew back then What I now know But I still ain't got no maps Of stars and moons I ain't got no tea leaves in my cup Like I said to God my way She don't drink and she don't smoke That's right, the girl never even fool I said, well, she got them New age ways Yeah, watch out Got the new age ways. Ooh, watch out. He's <laughs> a great, uh, a great blues guy, a younger uh, gentleman, not that much younger than me. Robert Jones, you ever heard Robert Jones from Detroit? Yeah. He is such a funny guy. We had him at the Merle Watson Festival last year, and uh, he's a great player. And he, he's actually a reverend. He plays some of this kind of churchier songs in his. Uh, in his church, but well, he plays some blues when he's not in church. And uh, he was at Merle Fest and he was doing a great show and he, at one point in the program he said, now now here's an opportunity to help some, some poor hungry black children in the ghetto in, in Detroit. Everybody could quiet and listen up. He says, go buy some of my CDs. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> a really nice man, a great performer and player. I met him the first time I played in Detroit. He, was, he had a radio show for blues, and I did a guitar workshop in some back room of a saloon. And he, uh, he, he came to the, the gig. Really nice guy. If you ever get a chance to see Robert Jones. I like that line about the hungry black children in the ghetto. I can't think to work that into my show. <laughs> it's not going to work. I'm going to finish up the first part of my program with another funny song that I learned from my friend Pink Anderson from Spartanburg. I wished he could be here tonight in Tiburon, but he's been dead since 76. Yes. Pink made two records in 1928, and that was about it for him. Spent the next 40 years... Uh, entertaining in these little medicine shows that travel through the South, showing cure-rolls and patent medicines. Pink could jump up on the back of a flatbed truck and sing a couple of funny songs to attract a little crowd, and then his buddy Peg Leg Sam would get out there and dance a couple of licks on his peg, blow his harmonica, they'd get a crowd up. You know, that's like Jonesboro, South Carolina, before Walmart. There wasn't much going on. <laughs> <laughs> then the doctor or the chief would come out and sell the patent medicine, guaranteed to cure anything you might have, you know, from acne to uh, athlete's feet, insomnia. Yeah, stuff would cure anything, they claimed. Sold it for a dollar a bottle, they made fortunes. Pink explained to me they had church ladies drinking alcohol about a teaspoonful three times a day. <laughs> Didn't cure a damn thing, but made people not care. <laughs> it's not that the purpose of medicine. I think about that a lot. Medicine shows, of course, are long gone. The last show went out in uh, 1970. I was supposed to go out with Chief Thunderclouds Medicine Show. Pink and Peggy had it all set up, and then the Chief's heart attacked them, and that was that. No more medicine shows. But it still goes on on your TV and your radio and your computer now. They're trying to sell you all kinds of crap. You, know, you, can't, get it in the, you can't get it from your doctor and you can't get it in the drugstore. Send in your $25 and we'll make it bigger. Don't you worry. <laughs> or smaller, whatever you want. And somebody must be sending in the money. They just must be. kind of song Pink used to sing back in those days. I just want to tell you about a man named Boone. His home was down in Tennessee. He made his living stealing chickens and anything he could see. That Popeye man runs so fast that his feet never did stand wrong. With the freight train passed, didn't matter how fast that boy would always get on board. He was a traveling man. Certainly was a traveling 
traveling man. He was the most travelingest man that ever was in that land. He traveled everywhere. He was known for many miles around. He didn't get cold and he never got whooped until the police shot him down. Well, the police hired an automobile with the purpose just to chase old Boone. They chased him from 6 o'clock in the morning till half past 7 the next afternoon. Why that Popeye man run so fast, fire did come from his heels. He burned up the cotton and he scorched the corn. He might as well have drove through the farmer's field. They called him a traveling man. Certainly was a traveling man. He was the most travelingest man that ever was in that land. He traveled everywhere. He was known for many miles around, but he didn't get caught in. Got whooped until the police shot him down. This boy went to the spring one day to get himself a pail of water. The distance that the rascal had to go couldn't have been more than two miles and a quarter. Got there and got his water. The boy started back and then he stumbled and he fell down. Ran through the house, got himself another bucket, caught the water before it touched the ground. He was a traveling man. He certainly was a traveling man. You know he was the most. It ever was in that The boy traveled, like I said He was known for many miles around But he didn't get caught Never got whooped until the police shot him down He, he was on a Titanic ship The day it was going down Standing out by the port side That's right, the boy had his head hung down When he did jump overboard The people said, man, you are a fool About two minutes Right after that, the man was shooting dice in Liverpool. People called him a traveling man. <laughs> Certainly was a traveling man. You know he was the most traveling. That's right, the most traveling. Everywhere. He was known for many miles around. Didn't get caught in there. The police caught the traveling man. They had him up to hang one day. The jury man all asked him, just what did he have to say? He begged the jury man to bow their heads, bow their heads in prayer. Then he crossed one leg and he winked an eye and he went up to the air. He was a traveling man. Take a little break. Thank you.
Well, I, it's weird, you know, sometimes you get inspiration for a song and sometimes a lot of people help you write a song and they're not even aware of it. I was at a blues festival with John Hammond, the great John Hammond, and he had just uh, suffered a miserable divorce and I, I, I did too and we were having a coffee at the espresso bar at some festival. Festivals have come a long way. <laughs> and uh, he said to me, he, he, he was hanging out with Robert Locker Jr. at the time, my, my pal now. Robert didn't really like me in those days. Well, he had John. But uh, he said, John said to me, he says, I was at Robert Locker's house and we were shooting pool and I was so bummed out about my divorce and everything. And Robert looked at me, he said, John, man, she did you a favor with me, you know, it was the best thing that could have happened. And John said that about four times. And he went to the men's room and I, I got my pencil and I wrote on a napkin, she did you a favor. That's a good one. I'm going to write a song because I was <laughs> going through the divorce. And I started writing it and the song was, be, it was a real depressing little number. And I, I played it for my old friend Jesse Thomas in Shreveport, Louisiana that made his first records in 1927 when he was 17. And I said, what do you think of this song? He said, Oh, he says, it's terribly depressing. He says, you got to make it a little more optimistic. So he started helping me change a few verses to make it a little better. And uh, the song developed from there. So Jesse Thomas was involved in it. John Hammond was involved in it and his ex-wife. Robert Lockwood was involved in it. And I was involved in it and my ex-wife. And then I needed a good uh, guitar part, and I was listening a lot to Muddy Waters' early stuff before he had the band. So all those people had something to do with writing this song. I call it, She Did You a Favor. I hope I remember it. I probably won't remember all the words, but you'll get the gist of it. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. It's probably involved in it. <laughs> <laughs>
a short period five years ago where we lost uh, four of my best blues playing pals <coughs> passed away unexpectedly, some of them. Uh, my dear brother in Lord David Rockbottom York died of a heart attack at 52, and then John Jackson, who was 76, I think, the cancer got him. He was a great uh, Afro-American blues player from uh, Virginia, great man. A lot of fun with old John Jackson, knew him for over 30 years. And then my dear pal and one of my first heroes of the guitar, Dave Van Ronk, passed away. The cancer got him. Shortly after he died, Dave Snake Array from Minneapolis. The cancer got him. 59. Call this song Another Man Done a Fool Go Round. time, you know, with the civil rights movement and the war and the politics and everything, everybody was going to change the world. And lo and behold, we started finding the old blues guys. We call them old blues guys. Looking back on it, they weren't that old. 
because they made records in the 20s and in the 60s. They were probably in their 60s, most of the guys. We thought they were ancient. Back in those days at a typical folk festival, they had a blues stage with people like Mississippi John Hurt, uh, Reverend Robert Wilkins, Booker White, Gary Davis, Sunhouse. And all these guys had made records in the 20s and early 30s. Uh, most of them hadn't played the guitar in 20, 20, 25 years. They found Sun House who taught Robert Johnson how to play the guitar. He was a porter on the New York Central Railroad living in Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. Hadn't seen the guitar in 30 years. Mm -hmm. Al Wilson from Candida had to teach him how to play. You know, remind him, this is how you did that number, do you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he did it. He made hundreds of dollars a week. <laughs> but one of the great discoveries was Mississippi John Hurt and Tom Huskins and his buddies were college boys in Washington, D.C., and they found an old 78 RPM record. The song was called Avalon's My Hometown. The artist's name was Mississippi John Hurt. By the time they sobered up, they were halfway to Mississippi looking for Avalon. They got to Avalon, they found John Hurt. It's like a miracle. He was a man about 65 years old, still played the guitar exactly like he did in 1928. The man hadn't learned a new guitar lick. We like that. <laughs> <laughs> Progress could be a terrible thing. Other great bluesmen were found that had progressed. We weren't very interested in that. Lonnie Johnson played festivals in Canada and Philadelphia as he wanted to play his red electric guitar and sing Red Sails in the Sunset. Everybody was asking for mean bedbug blues. He said, what are you talking about? I don't even remember that song. So John Hurt became a star, made hundreds of dollars a week. Lonnie Johnson didn't do so well. And John was very interesting because he was from Mississippi and most of the Delta players played real harsh, loud music with the slide and made a big commotion, moaned about the condition of their women and things. And John Hurt just played nice guitar, very melodic. Three fingers played. Very appealing to us back in the boogie days. Still is. He did little songs like that. He did little songs like uh, My Creole Bell. I love to. songs he did. Not one of his most popular, but it is a great one. He called it Keep It Knocking, But You Can't Come In. <laughs> keep it knocking, but you can't come in. Keep it knocking, but you come in. Keep it knocking, but you can't come in. Come back tomorrow night, right again. Come back tomorrow night, right again. I know you love me, but you can't come in. I know you love me, but you can't come in, keep it knocking, but you can't come in. Come back tomorrow night. Come back tomorrow night. I know you've been out drinking gin. Can't 
the man keep an eye but you can't come in. Come back tomorrow night, try it again. Come back tomorrow night, try it again. Come back tomorrow night, try it again. on it as was Reverend Gary Davis and I call it uh, it's going to be all right someday it's going to be okay <laughs> C.C.N.O. Blues, the song he recorded in 1928 on Columbia Records, told me that they took the train, him and his blind friend Simmy Dooley, who taught him how to play guitar by beating him with a switch. He said, if he didn't play it right, Simmy was, was sitting there with the switch. He did it with the switch. Bam! Bam! He said he took a beating to learn how to play guitar. <laughs> Blind guy could hit you anywhere, you know, it was dangerous. He <laughs> 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 for his hands, but he kept hitting him in the head. <laughs> and Pink told me they went down to Atlanta and made two, they made four, four songs, two records, and uh, they got real drunk and they played too fast. But I knew a record collector in New York City back before they had reissued CDs. We had to listen to 78 RPM records, you know. And this guy had a huge collection, thousands of these old records. and. He, he let me record uh, the four songs that Pink Anderson recorded in 28. He had the original records. We used to put them on a record player. Every every couple of Fridays, we'd meet at his Greenwich Village pad and hang out in the 60s and do what people did in the 60s and listen to old records. It was great. And as I made a tape recording of it, I called up Pink one day and I played him the records on the phone. I said, you know what that is? He said, that's me and Simmy Dooley. I said, that's right. He said, you got the rest of that song? I said, I got all four of them. 
played him the four songs. It cost me a lot in those days on the phone. Mm -hmm. I said, how'd you like that? He said, that was fine. <laughs> and he went back to sleep. It was about four o'clock in the morning when I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> the next spring I was down in Spartanburg. I spent two weeks with Mr. Pink. He was a bootlegger and ran a gambling joint. It was a lot of fun to go there on vacation. <laughs> I was getting ready to say goodbye, we were sitting out in front of his house smoking cigarettes, and he said, Roy, I said, Ben, he says, last winter time, did you call me up and play me records on the telephone? <laughs> I said, me and Simi, I said, yeah, I did. He took a long drag on the cool regular, he said, you want to know, I thought about that the whole winter long, I didn't know if that was a dream of it, really. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you want to know something? I said, what's that? He said, we made those records in 1928, April. I said, yeah, I know that. He said, I'm going to tell you something now. The first time I ever heard those records was that morning you called me up. <laughs> I said, you never got a copy of the record you made? He said, no. Nope. Never sold it. He gave me $50. It was $50 a song. I said, well, that's not bad. I recorded for Rounder for 12 years. If they gave me $50 a song, I'd have more money than I do now. <laughs> like my fancy lawyers and contracts. <coughs> I still owe them production costs. <laughs> That's the latest claim. 18 years. We started Peg Leg Records. I realized while they're in the record business, they're making some money. <laughs> enough politics. This is a song Pink recorded, the CCNO Blues. The CCNO was the train that went by Pink's house, the Chesapeake, Charleston, and Ohio.
once, I know she can die. She's the kind of gal that's sort of lonely but nice. I got a gal, and she's crazy about me. I love my baby. me 
shops in America and you even do concerts in some like Eric Schoenberg's mm -hmm. in Tiburon, California. I said, are there other shops like that? <laughs> I wrote back, I said, there is no, no place in the world like Eric Schoenberg's <laughs> in <laughs> Tiburon, <laughs> California. <laughs> but you get many orders from the foreign country, wherever it is. I used to tour in Europe quite a bit, but I, uh, I just don't like to travel that far anymore. And none of them speak English. It's awkward. And the plane seats keep getting smaller and smaller. What's with that? For the last 10 years, I've been paying everything, all my bills with my American Express card. My wife tells me you'll get lots of frequent flyer miles and you could fly somewhere. And now I have hundreds of thousands of frequent fire miles, but I really desire never to get in a plane again. <laughs> but I, I decided if, if I go back to England, that's the most civilized of the countries, uh, I could probably go first class with all my miles. Then go over there and make hundred dollars a week. It'd be great. <laughs> great friends in England and Ireland and Norway. I don't think any 
anywhere else. <laughs> I got one in France, but I'm never going back there to work. Well, I'll never say never. <laughs> God bless them. <laughs> this here is a popular song a lot of the guitar players love. Brian Blake recorded this in the 20s. One of the few tunes he played in open D tuning. He probably played in E tuning, he probably tuned up. I'm just going to do a few more songs. I see people getting edgy. <laughs> Get busy myself. Okay. Uh, this one here is the Police Dog Blues, and uh, this is recorded by most of my colleagues, including Ry Cooter, Leon Redbone, uh, Yorma Kalkinen, Ernie Hawkins, Edda Baker. Did you ever record this? No. Well, you're probably the only guy. <laughs> He's got a great intro. Jesse Thomas' song, You'll Never Find Another Friend Like Me. No. Oh, good. Jesse Thomas from Shreveport, uh, he was a cool old guy. He recorded this song in the late 40s. Thanks for 
coming out to Schoenberg's Guitars, where you can buy strings, guitar tuners, finger picks, string winders, guitars, ukuleles, guitar straps, slides.
and it was a famous trip. He and John, John and Alan Lomax went down to Mississippi looking for Robert Johnson, I think, but he was already dead. And they recorded some great music. It was a, they found a young tractor driver in Mississippi at Stovall's Plantation named Muddy Waters, who ended up having quite a career. But uh, he first recorded playing, uh, I think he was playing Mr. Lomax's little Martin guitar on that session. And uh, that turned out good for Muddy, who went on to become the King of Chicago Blues and tour with Eric Clapton and all that great stuff. Muddy did good. I mean, he, the American dream. He went from being a sharecropper to being a slumlord in Chicago. God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but he did own buildings. <laughs> At least he owned one. Muddy was a big star. And then uh, the same session, uh, the same week they were down there, they went across the Mississippi River into Arkansas to Sadie Beck's plantation, which was right across from the Mississippi Delta. Mississippi Delta is actually near, <coughs> it's northern Mississippi, God bless you. People always think it's way down south where the Mississippi River Delta would be, but it's got nothing to do with that. I don't know much about geography, but, but the Delta's right around there, uh, around Tunica, Mississippi, where all the casinos are now. We got about eight casinos down there, it's like little Las Vegas. A lot of jobs, it's really helped Mississippi a great deal. I mean, a lot of, more wealthy people go there and lose their money than poor people. A very famous man once said the job of the night people is to take, take the money from the day people. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for coming out to the show tonight. <laughs> So they went to Sadie Beck's plantation and they recorded Honey Boy Edwards, who was a young farmhand who's now 91 years old and you can see him playing the joints. It's unbelievable. And they recorded his friend Willie Brown. And this is this Willie Brown was not Sunhouse's friend. There's a lot of Willie Browns in the blues uh, history from that area. But Willie Brown, who recorded this song, never made a commercial record. He just recorded for the Library of Congress and then he died or drifted off into obscurity. But this was one of the most greatest guitar arrangements any of us in New York ever heard when that record came out. And uh, people like, uh, we all started playing it, Stephen Grossman. Uh, I bet you Eric plays oh, this yeah. one. Eric played this, he was probably first. Close. You were, you, you were right there. We played this song to death, but it's a beauty. And. Uh, Stephen Grossman and Rory Block and uh, Eric and me and everybody was playing this. I recorded it in 71 and uh, I went on tour in England at the time and, and when I played this song over there, the people were going nuts for it. They were jumping out of windows and all, all the guitar players would come up to me and say, uh, all the Mississippi blues, he says, uh, Stephen Grossman used to come over here and play that song, but he didn't tell us there was words to it. <laughs> <laughs> he played it as an instrumental. It's yeah. a beautiful song. God bless Steph. Uh, so I'll we'll finish up with uh, Willie Brown's Mississippi Blues. <laughs> see Honey Boy Edwards, I got surprised him in New York City at B.B. King's and I walked backstage. I said, Honey Boy, it's Roy Bookbinder. He said, oh, whoop, whoop. I said, yeah, I'll do Willie Brown song. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see him, he wants me to play him this song. Oh, it's a good song. He said, you can play that song. I said, I don't know. Going down to the Delta, Mama, where I can have my fun. You know I'm going back down to the Delta. Ooh, Mama, where I can have my have my fun. Where I can drink my white lightning whiskey and I can gamble and bring my baby, bring my baby home. Don't the devil look lonesome, mama When that evening When that evening sun goes down Don't the devil look lonesome When that evening sun goes down You might be looking 
That's right, man, you might be looking for your good gal, but you know that she can't, she just can't be found. I said that I love you, baby, although I know you treat your daddy wrong. Yes, I said that I love you, baby. Although I know you had to treat your daddy wrong Cause I'm sick and I'm tired of drifting Through this evil, evil cruel world alone I'm going down to the doctor Mama where I can have my fun You know I'm going back down to the doctor Mama where I can have my fun That's right where I can drink my white line of whiskey and I can gamble Bring my baby Ooh, Bring my baby home Well I know you mistreat me baby but I can't help but love you I can't help and love you Love you just the same I know you have mistreat me but I can't help and love you just the same Because it grieves my poor heart to hear That's right, it grieves my poor heart to hear Some other man when he stops calling your name